recording to the clock. Okay, now we're recording. Um, Y'all have to remind me of that. My classes always have to remind me of that <laughs> um, at United. So um, anyway, it's good to see you all. Um, most of you I know um, have met at different points. Um, the way this is going to go, I'm going to go ahead and share um, the screen. And once I do that, I can't see you all. Um, so if you have something that you need, raise your hand. Does everybody know how to do the raise your hand button? It's in the reactions. <laughs> okay. Um, it just says raise hand and then you can go from there. Um, so I'm going to put us into share mode. And let's see. Um, like I said, I, I can only see like four or five of you at this point. So if you have something you need to ask me or whatever, um, just raise your hand in the reactions button. And if everybody would make sure they're muted just so that we don't have, um, I'm hoping my dogs are sleeping. So I'm hoping they're going to behave and not uh, create a scene here. But if somebody comes by that they're sure is gonna kill me, they'll let us know. Um, so what we're gonna do, um, in these two sessions, as we've said in the publicity we've sent out, tonight we're going to look at the meanings of symbol and metaphor and how they express themselves at Mayflower. And then next week we'll look at the history of the Mayflower in particular and discuss then what all of this means um, for us now and into the future. And I think the question that we're asking ourselves is what is our legacy? as we approach our hundredth year and what do we want it to be in our second hundred? So that's that's where we're going with all of this. Um, a few notes, we are not making any decisions here about the name of the church. Um, I know people think that's what we're doing, but um, we're merely opening a conversation. This is the beginning of many conversations um, I believe. And our healthy guidelines apply to our discussions. Um, if you don't know what those are, um, you know, let me know and I'll get you a copy of them or they're on the website if you want to go there and look for them. Um, the way I'm going to structure this is I'm going to do about a half an hour of information and then we're going to break into small groups for about a half an hour and then we'll come back together for the last half an hour for a large group conversation. So that's that's where we're going. Um, so let me just start with what's a metaphor. I, I know most of you probably know what this is, but it never hurts to remind ourselves and to make sure that we're all on the same wavelength. Um, metaphor is a figure of speech. Um, it's how we describe things describing things in a way that isn't literally true. And of course, we all know Mayflower is not big into literalism. So metaphor is a big deal for us. Um, it helps us to explain things by making comparisons. So the example that, that this wiki um, meme gives is the assignment was a breeze. Um, other metaphors that we might think of is Einstein once said, all religions, arts, and sciences are branches of the same tree. Um, we know from, you know, A Christmas Carol, old Marley was dead as a doornail. Um, and then we talk about couch potatoes, watching TV all day long, or we, re we refer to people that we really love as you're the apple of my eye. That's all metaphors. Um, but we've got them at Mayflower too, and in Christianity, because metaphors are the heart and soul of Bible, church, and Christian theology. And just a little pun there, you see what I did. Um, they're the heart of heart and soul, um, but they're not literally. Um, but we talk about bread. We talk about communion. Um, some of us interpret communion as purely a symbol and we'll talk about symbols in a minute. Some of us interpret it as having more meaning than that, that it becomes a metaphor for Jesus. 
Um, Jesus is the light of the world is another way of looking at it. So we do all of these kinds of ways of talking. Um, there are bad metaphors. Um, whoops, excuse me. No, that's what I wanted next was power of metaphors. Metaphors are used by everyone in many, many different disciplines. They matter a great deal. They add richness and beauty to our lives and to our speech. They reveal truth. They're ways that we can understand that we can't understand, but they can also be used in ways that work for ill or can mislead or taint. Um, metaphors express what we perceive and they influence what we perceive. And metaphors allow us to make discoveries by seeing things in a new way. Um, so to give you an example of a bad metaphor, um, we've all heard America referred to as a melting pot. Um, that is an unhelpful bad metaphor in many, many ways um, because people come here from all over, but they don't get melted into one sort of people. We're still diverse people. Um, and so the melting pot idea is one way of getting around racism by pretending it doesn't exist. Um, another way to look at it, though, is another metaphor about racism is we often hear it said these days that racism is in our DNA as a country. Well, the implication there is that we can't change it. You know, we don't change our DNA. Um, and I, for one, hope we can change that DNA. Um, I don't want it to, to, you know, be a problem. So let me stop share there for just a second and see if there's any questions that people have um, about any of that. And welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Sorry about the uh, passcode problem. Any, any questions? I know this is stuff you know, but it doesn't hurt to just make sure we're all together. All right, well, we'll go back to, to this. So um, racism isn't in the DNA of our country, but it is part and parcel of everything that we understand ourselves to be. Um, Richard Rohr, who many of us have read, has written, metaphor is the only possible language available to religion because it alone is honest about mystery. That's his take on metaphor. Um, and sorry, sometimes memes don't translate very well onto PowerPoint, but that's another thing. Um, symbols. Symbols are very, very important as well. A symbol is an object or a picture that represents something else. It doesn't try to be something that it's not. Um, it communicates in a very quick way. So if you look at the symbols on the right, most of those are ones that I'm sure you could recognize very quickly um, if you saw them on a bumper sticker or a, you know, a sign, something like that. Um, because we use symbols all the time. Um, we use them in our everyday life. These are also symbols that you probably know very quickly. Um, you know, we know, excuse me, the recycling one no smoking, um, the other recycling one. Um, all of these different kinds of things are really, really important as we think about, um, about the language that we use. And Mayflower has its symbols too. Um, these are some of them. The cross is a symbol. Um, our pride banner and the pride rainbow flag is a symbol. Um, the dream catcher is also a symbol. Um, these are all things that we are familiar with at Mayflower, and we each interpret them in our own ways. Um, we each work with them um, to, to make sure that uh, we are able to 
you know, continue to be together without having to explain everything constantly. So when you see the pride flag, you know we are an open and affirming congregation. And our pride flag is now out of date because there's a new pride flag with other colors in it to represent the trans community and the bi community. So um, I'm going to put you into small groups in just a second. I have to see how many of you are here. And then um, we will um, take a look at, uh, at these kinds of questions. Um, whoops, let me go back. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my own technology here. But before I put you in small groups, has anybody got any questions in the large group at this point? Like I said, this is not, this is no brainer information, but I just want us to all start from here. Could you put up the um, questions that were briefly on the screen just a minute I'm, ago? I'm putting them in the chat. Right. Um, and then everybody will be able to see them when they're in the small groups. So there you go. All right. Any other technical questions? All right. So we have one, two, three, four, five. Twenty twenty one. So um, let's do groups. Where did my small group thing go? Breakout rooms. There we go. Um, I'm going to put you in eight different groups, and that puts two to three people in each group, um, and. Um, we're going to go for about 30 minutes um, just talking about these questions. If you don't know each other, please introduce yourselves. Um, talk about the metaphors that we use about ourselves and at Mayflower. Um, and then also, I've got Thor emailing me. Um, <laughs> um, and then what do they mean to you? What might they mean to other people? as they see those things and what symbols do you associate with Mayflower? And again, what do they mean to you and to other people? So if you will spend some time talking about those things, we'll come back and talk about them as a whole group. So I'm gonna create the breakout rooms and- um, Are you gonna list the questions someplace? The questions are in the chat. So you should be able to access okay. them when you're in the breakout rooms. All right, okay. okay. All right, here we go. Anita, I'm gonna stay on deck here in case more people are hitting me up. I, I responded to Diane and Thor, so no need to um, get back to that. Then. Okay. Okay, Whew. technology is just so much fun. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm gonna tell Celeste to take off the uh, the need for a password um, so we don't have to do that next week. Yeah, that sounds good. I was surprised when it popped up because I just didn't expect it to. Yeah, me too. I knew there was gonna be something happen, so. Yeah. Okay, so it's- You can do that. I'm gonna send her an email right now, actually. I'm gonna- pull us back together um, about 20 after. Cool. And we'll probably end early. And I'm going to go feed the dogs before they decide that they're no longer happy with me. So that sounds good. Oh, and this has all been recording. So let me. Okay. So there were eight groups. So I'm not going to ask for eight reports. <laughs> but Let's start with metaphors. What did you come up with in terms of metaphors? Anything? Spiritual Nothing. journey. What's that? Spiritual journey. Spiritual journey. 
bubbling up. Bubbling up. Jesus path. Jesus path. Any others? Covenant. Covenant. Singing. Yeah, music. Music becomes a metaphor for us oftentimes. Ship to shore. Potluck. <laughs> <laughs> One that we didn't get, but uh, it's interesting. This is a repeat after me prayer. This is a repeat after me prayer, just the way people have uh, appropriated that. Mm -hmm. So maybe the metaphor is uh, there's a little bit of playfulness, maybe. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever heard Mayflower referred to as our church family? Upon occasion, I hope faith, not too often. Faith community is what I hear. Yeah. Community is a much better term, but I do hear people periodically talk about my church family. Hmm. That would be an interesting discussion. That it's I a really bad metaphor. Right. That would imply we don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> it implies we're limited. Mm -hmm. it, it, as I say, metaphors or a family is a closed system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, you either have to marry into it or, or you have to find some way to be invited into it. You you just don't show up and decide to join somebody's family. Um, so it's a, it's a rough, it's kind so of a rough the, metaphor to use, but you don't get the, sorry, what, Joe? You don't get the warmth and depth of relationship feeling out of community in the same way as family. Mm -hmm. Which is why some people prefer it. Any other metaphors that you can talk with? Okay. <laughs> How about symbols? I mean, I was talked about uh, prayer shawls, um, you know, prayer holding shawl. someone in the arm of the church. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, a prayer shawl becomes a metaphor for the prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But it is, or a symbol of the prayer. Yeah. Somebody else was getting ready to say something. Oh, the, the ship, the Mayflower bow relief. Mm hmm The bow the relief. Also the one in the fireside room up above the fireplace. Yeah. Yeah. The um I think it's a dream catcher that's yeah. in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And the way it's juxtap juxtaposed right in front of all of the Mayflower ships that are carved into the organ, mm -hmm. I think is kind of weird. Mm. Mm -hmm. Weird. Interesting contrast. Yeah. What other symbols did you talk about? I was a member of Mayflower for a number of years before I realized those were little ships in the organ. I thought it was an abstract. Uh, <laughs> and then someone brought it up in a, you know, a sermon or something. And I, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. we talked about the singing bowl, mm. singing bowl mm -hmm. and the eternal light and the baptismal font bowl. And mm -hmm. sometimes those <laughs> things to me, symbols kind of get mixed up with traditions, but I guess if it's a physical thing, it can be a symbol mm -hmm. that leads to a tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the uh, style uh, talked about the the communion table and not having a rail that separates us from the table of communion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, Diane, I something. was just gonna say uh, those ships in the organ uh, backdrop were all carved by different families at Mayflower. We got to carve a ship, and Dorothy had a map of where your ship was. And I used to know where my ship was, or the ship our family carved was. So it was sort of was, that's sort of a symbol that we all participated in making. Anyway, that's just a history, history factoid. Mm -hmm. I want to know that. You actually I carved was... it? You didn't just design it, you carved it? No, you're absolutely right. We just designed it. 
You're absolutely right. Dorothy had blocks and we drew our ship and then she got them carved. I think that's the way it was. Well, My memory, you know. I have part of part of history, but not all of it. <laughs> one of the one of the interesting things about the symbol that is the the ship art in the fireside room is that when it was originally it was commissioned for that space. And it originally had no women in it. Hmm. So it was removed from the wall and redone to include women. And so I find this conversation so fitting. It's like a continuation of an earlier hmm. conversation. Um, so, so, uh, and so the, the, the kind of metamorphosis of that piece of art is, um, is just part of the same road that we're on. So it's just, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've always found it interesting that the skin tones of the people in that are very dark or they're dark, darker than I would have expected. Um, other symbols that you... We've talked about the, the seasonal hangings mm -hmm. behind the um, pulpit and uh, just, you know, church, church for all seasons and uh, in all seasons of our lives. But I just wanna know why there's no snow in the winter one. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. is this not minnesota maybe it's a whole lot of denial <laughs> yeah <laughs> could be there's a particular shape to the cross that's on the building and in, in front of the church i wondered about that and what type of cross is that and and why was that chosen does anyone know or hmm. something to discover Mm -hmm. I, I think about the difference sometimes between what's intended and how things actually end up. And I think about those giant puppets that Heart of the Beast helped us make, or we were part of that process, and the number of children that are incredibly terrified by the giant Jesus coming out. And, yeah. you know, kids talk about it like, is the big, big Jesus is going to be there, right? Like, this is actually a thing among some of the small children. So... Uh. We actually yeah. laid them down one time in yeah. the floor of the chapel mm -hmm. and the kids came in by the different classes and, and got to touch them. And mm -hmm. I think for those kids, they became less frightening um, because they were, um, oh, they were, they were able to actually get up close to them and see what they were made of and, and stuff. But yeah, you're right. And Our attention wonderful. was something really good, and the kids are, ah, what's that? <laughs> uh, on the other hand, awe is an important experience. Of, I agree. Of religion. So, but if you can touch it and love it and not be scared of it, mm -hmm. ideal. Yeah, I say there's a difference between awe and freaked yeah. out by. Um, <laughs> no. Indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> Other things that you talked about. I thought of one a minute ago and it just popped out of my head when we were talking about the puppets. Um, uh, one of the, um, Anita, one of the things that uh, Marty brought up is the, obviously the importance of <clears throat> music. Um, but I should let him speak about that a little bit because <clears throat> he, he had some good insights there. <laughs> um, I came late to the meeting. I, I just, out of the blue, I thought maybe the password is Mayflower and then it worked. I just <laughs> don't know how that happened. But um, uh, no, I, I knew several of the editors on the New Century Hymnal and metaphor was a big part of what they were thinking of and the importance of words. Uh, and it was a very provocative hymnal when it came out because what well, they called it the new century hymnal because we're gonna enter a new century with a new vision of inclusiveness for the church. And the, the, the one that I remember when Bud Friend Jones was at Mayflower, he was going to use a litany that's in the back of the hymnal. You can look this up. 
It's called a litany of light and darkness. And Bud said, there isn't any light in this litany. It's all darkness <laughs> because they had become very captivated by what they saw as a racial overtones of light and darkness in language. Um, and I thought that was so you and I think for those who were around when the hymnal came out, the, the shocking part for them was the language of Christmas carols because they were in people's bones mm -hmm. and the metaphors there, uh, or at least the language was so upsetting that it was hard for them to engage in a new way of saying the same thing. Yeah. Christmas carols are the one thing that nobody can quite abide in the new century hymnal. That's why, that's why Mayflower has the red Christmas carol book. Right. right. People were and, and they're just not very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They I was telling our little group that I had a hymn called Gather a Sin, which I wrote back in 1980. And they, uh -huh. I got a call from Ruth Duck, one of the editors on the committee, and she said, you have the line, gather us in the blind and the lame, and that doesn't work. And uh -huh. I said, yeah, give me a suggestion. She said, well, how about free us from shame? And I said, that's fine. I, that's, that's just great. Um, and then I got another call that said, we're uncomfortable with images of light and darkness. When we took those images out, there really wasn't anything left. <laughs> so we can't do without metaphors, but metaphors right. have all kinds of bells and rings. You know, the art, like the art in the fireside room, is going to affect different people in very different ways. And music and text, especially if they're in our bones, affect us that way. Mm -hmm. Wow. We were talking about. Um, Mayflower is a singing church being a metaphor for community, that it's not one person singing, it's the congregation singing together and bringing each of us bringing something into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, and I have to say that the, mm -hmm. this is not knocking wearing masks for COVID. But it is so hard to feel that same thing trying to sing through a mask. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it it's obviously happens and we do it, but there is a different sort of sense of, of community when you can't really mm -hmm. fully see each other. I mean, I still look at some people going, who are you? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that, I mean, that's just the nature of, <laughs> where we are right now with the pandemic and um, as it changes, but um, yeah, but music is very important in this congregation. Did you talk at all about what these symbols mean to each of you personally or metaphors mean to you personally? Mm -hmm. And are, if you're comfortable sharing any of that conversation. Spiritual journey uh, was something that really, really grabbed me. I heard it when we first joined Mayflower. And I said, that's it. That's my life. Mm -hmm. And the idea of sharing it with others uh, really captivated me. I was, I was hooked at that point. Because we said we were covenanting to help each other in our spiritual journeys instead of having a creed. Uh, so we each had our spiritual journeys, and certainly mine has been one that uh, got me deeply into the church in my teens and got me out of the church in college and brought me back to the church in middle age and has led onward from there. Uh, so it's, it, it's a great metaphor for me. And when I think about the Mayflower, I think about a spiritual voyage you know, you could say, uh, put that in a boat. Um, and uh, I'll just say right off that uh, to to discard the Mayflower is to discard the notion of the church as a, as a, as a ship, as a boat, which is very, very ancient. And for me, discarding the notion of, of, a, of a spiritual voyage, something that travels, I would sorely miss. 
Thank you, Jeff. Others, Diane. Um, I fessed up that I always have trouble with a dream catcher. Mm -hmm. It seems to me to be cultural appropriation and I don't like it. And I was overjoyed the time it fell off the ceiling. <laughs> but I also understand why it was put up and that it, you know, it was done in a respectful manner. But it's it as a symbol it bothers me. So I try to ignore it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Others. Anita? Yes. I I used to halfway quip about the Mayflower being a um uh, a camp, a transition camp, a refugee camp. Um, and I think that was a metaphor that I carried for a long time, because I think many of us came from traditions that really we walked away from or left because, and I mean, I came out of a <laughs> Missouri Senate background, so I had left that. And, but the question is the difference between a a refugee camp and a home. And I think I've gotten more and more that it's a home. Uh, and I think for me, the refugee camp thing is that we have lots of searchers. And uh, the question always then is, uh, are we able to, or are we willing um, to work with them all? Or is it inevitable that many of them will leave? Um, so that's, you know, uh, one of my thoughts, because I think um, uh, some of us feel very comfortable and maybe that in itself is a problem. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Well, this may segue a bit from that, but I think in our group and my group members can challenge me if I misunderstood. Um, I think the Jesus path is a, a sort of a metaphor or image that doesn't always work for people. Mm -hmm. Some people, it's maybe not Christological enough. And for other people, it's too defining around a particular way of being in a sort of multicultural, multi-faith world. So it's, it's a mixed sort of metaphor or image. Thanks, Karen. It's interesting you bring that up. Yesterday in the class I teach at United Seminary, we were talking about mission and vision statements, and I shared um, ours with them. And, you know, they came back and said, what is this Jesus path thing? That doesn't make any sense, you know, which led into a conversation about having outsiders perhaps look at your, <laughs> your stuff, but in order to, to say, what does that mean to get you to be more articulate? They were actually very kind about Mayflower's stuff. We looked at several different <laughs> mission and vision statements and, and they really took apart a couple of the others, but um, actually all of the others they took apart. So. <laughs> but I, it was an open feel for them to do that. But it's, it's, it is a metaphor that I'm not sure how people connect to it or don't. Um, I don't know. Are people who, we, other people? We talked about the metaphor of, of Christian. Um, you know, what does that mean in, in our day and time when Christian can mean anything from a completely open, progressive, um, cry boos and jew boos and you know all uh, 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 and then on the other end are the rabid fundamentalists and and we all go by the term christian what does that even mean both with that and with jesus path they're good examples of the connotations and you know back to that what's intended and what's perceived and there's a lot of me for example that likes the jesus path if i think of it as marcus borg dominic crossan and you know the historical jesus and how he lived and what he taught and such but it also harkens back to the jesus people days of the you know 1970s which maybe we wouldn't necessarily want to claim in terms of a you know christologically and almost a deifying and buddying of jesus yeah i think when you any metaphor is going to be limited 
And I think it, it's, it's a way to invite people at its best, rather than tell people you don't belong to this metaphor, but to say, let's open it up like you were doing, Anita, with your class. What I would say to someone if they asked me is that a path is to choose a way. And I remember it was either Thich Nhat Hanh or the Dalai Lama who said, if you're born a Christian, that's your path. Just find a way to live it well. Mm -hmm. And to say the Jesus path, I don't look at it as um, Jesus, this is just my own personal, as a son of God, but I look at the path that he lived. If you're following this, you're living and acting in the way that Jesus acted. And I think the way we use scripture at Mayflower is to try and get beneath the story into what Jesus was doing. All these bumper stickers say, what would Jesus do? And when that always implies, I know what he would do. <laughs> I, I feel like saying, what, what did Jesus do? Um, At our house, it's what would Joe do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I find it a helpful metaphor for me, but yeah. it's because of the way I interpret it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see the very nature of a metaphor is that it's up to the person that's interpreting it. Which is part of its blessing and part of its curse mm -hmm. in that regard. Susan, were you going to say something? Oh, I was thinking of the, the ships in the organ and how they could be a metaphor for journey, taking a journey for a spiritual journey for going on the Jesus path. So there's that, there, those being all similar kinds of metaphors. Yeah. That we are not static. Mm -hmm. God is still speaking. Yeah. 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 One of the things that we talked about a little bit in our group was, um, piggybacking on the idea of bad metaphors was that um, you can have a, um, a metaphor that has too much room in it, um, too much space. Mm. Um, and then piggybacking on what Jane said, it can be come to be understood as something really damaging and dangerous because of or unhelpful um, because because of the capacity to fill it with whatever understanding you bring to the table and um, and I can it you know it gets back to that conversation about attentionality I uh, America is different in that except for the indigenous folks, all of us came from somewhere else. And, um, and we can all understand that as the kernel idea behind the melting pot metaphor. Um, and, and yet um, we now have a couple hundred years of history and we also have a lot of other things happening. And so, the specificity of the the phrase melting pot isn't a fit really, but it's can come to be used in a really dangerous way. So it, I the takeaway I I don't know what the takeaway is, but uh, except that our conversation was hinged on a little bit of the what happens when there's intentionality in the creation of the metaphor to achieve a certain purpose and then maybe not enough care about it or um, the room isn't read well or something and it ends up um, doing the opposite thing from what it's intended to do. I'm not being very articulate, but it, it, uh, it was an interesting conversation. Um, well, and, and part of what I hear related to that is, um, you know, maybe there is a core, you know, what is it that original metaphor was intended to, to say, you know, like the melting pot in a way was saying, you know, there's place for everybody, though it turned into this assimilation and such. And so things like a fruit salad or a stew, maybe, or what metaphors might be a better way of expressing the sense that we come from all these different places. And, and maybe that's, you know, part of where Mayflower is, what are, you know, me metaphor, metaphors that maybe once upon a time were helpful, but not so much now. And, 
that's where you know creative spirit comes in and all that right i wondered we didn't talk about it in our group but um i've wondered about the impact of metaphor on people who are trying to learn the english language um mm -hmm. so so many of the things that you put up uh if learning english you wouldn't necessarily know what any of those things meant um and I don't know where to go with that, but it just seemed that that, that could well be a barrier to understanding, uh, to communication, or to welcoming. Uh, how do you um, how do you stay mindful of those that are outside? Uh, the uh, the metaphors can become uh, defining of our our club or uh, you know our entity to the exclusion of those that haven't learned those words yet. Well, I think one of the one of the things that we all know pretty well is um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a metaphor, or Father is in particular, um, and that's a metaphor that turns a lot of people off, mm -hmm. um, and other people find great comfort in it. Um, I remember when we started using the New Zealand Lord's version of the Lord's Prayer. And Lord, incidentally, is another one of those loaded words. Mm -hmm. um, but people were upset about it. And somehow I drew the short straw and had to preach about it. And, um, you know, talked in the sermon about metaphors and that there's different ways that we understand these things. And, um, you know, we had quite quite the discussion about it, but I think it sort of lowered some of the temperature a little bit, um, especially when I pulled out one of the interpretations of the Lord's Prayer from the Aramaic, which is really far out there. And several people decided they were really lucky. They were really, really <laughs> we glad that we that. weren't using that version. So, <laughs> um, you know, um, oh, birther, it starts, you mm. know, um, oh. and... Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, you know, translation from the Aramaic, but it's very different from where the things are. Others, things you. I this. I wanted to just comment yeah. briefly on the person that talked about um, about sort of the trouble others might have interpreting our metaphors. And I think the implication there was it was people maybe who came from a different culture, but even people from different churches sometimes have a lot of trouble interpreting the metaphors that we're really super used to. You know, we talked in our group a little bit, the use of Jesus path is like that. That's maybe the most obvious, but I found when I joined or was started coming to Mayflower, lots of things were, that seemed so obvious to us, you know, to the others were completely opaque to me. Um, the whole idea of being a moderator. I mean, somebody would say to me, I'm the moderator. I'm like, what, what does that even mean? And they obviously felt like it was really important and that they were really important, but I had no clue what they were talking about. I'm like, oh, good. You know, you know, I think, when we have our own vocabulary and our own symbols, we need to realize that those can divide us from other people and make us more difficult for people to join the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Point. Good point. I mean, in visiting around, having worked for the conference to various churches, I was always um, uh, very aware that in the bulletin, it would say Lord's Prayer. And that's all it would say. And the assumption was everybody knew what that was. But for somebody visiting, they may not know what that is, or they may not know the version that's being used or any of those kinds of things. So we, I mean, we have to be very aware. I, I think one of the things that we need to be most aware of in the church is how we are perceived and how we receive others in. Um, not just, you know, who we are. And I know when we moved here, we were visiting lots of churches. And I can tell you the number of churches that nobody said boo to us. Hmm. 
I mean, we were completely invisible. And one church, the pastor introduces to all the other gay and lesbian people in the congregation. And they talked to us, it was clear, as long as they thought it was polite. And then they went off to talk to themselves and left us standing there with a cup of coffee. You know, it was very weird. You know, so how how do we see those kinds of of things in as visitors? Um, I often ask would I ask churches, members of churches, to to think about coming in, and you've never been there before. What looks different? What's you know? And most people can't do it because, like you said, Beth, we're so we're so used to things that we don't see what other people see. Um, that's why I had to explain what the Jesus path was to my students, even though they're all seminarians. I went to the chapel in uh, Seattle University in Washington, in Seattle, Washington, and it's a Jesuit um, chapel on the campus, but they had a booklet that you were welcome to take that went through their space. It didn't talk about the language or the ritual, but it said, here's the significance of this. And it was full of illustrations. And it was a deliberate attempt for someone coming in as a newcomer to see it. And if that could be given by the host who sees somebody who's obviously new mm -hmm. and, um, you know, say, here's why there's a singing bowl. Here's the history of our church. Here are questions that we raise with each other. Um, here's what we mean, at least some of us, by the Jesus path little simple things. And here's why we use 16 different versions of the Lord's Prayer. Here's why it's actually called the Lord's Prayer. This is what a conference is, because <laughs> that, wouldn't, that yeah. wouldn't resonate. So I think the more we can make people feel welcome into a community that may not be like theirs, um, it's been an adjustment for me to have multiple versions of the Lord's Prayer. Um, not because I can't pray it, but because I grew up with a version that I got in my bones. And I'm afraid that high school kids won't have a prayer that mm -hmm. deeply ingrained mm -hmm. in their bones. Right. I sound like a Luddite by saying that, but I think... Well, they won't. Yeah, so that's really funny you brought that up, Marty, because I think I was here, I don't know, maybe like a year and a half into my time here, and someone had said, oh, that's the, like the New Zealand prayer is the Lord's Prayer, just modernized. And I had a very visceral, like, wait, that's not the Lord's prayer. You know, I had, I was like, no, that's not. And I had a whole debate with, with Elijah and with Sarah and with everyone, all the worship team. I was like, that's not the Lord. That's not what it is. You know, and I'm not, that's not necessarily like my stance right now, but I had a very strong, like, wait, what? Like, don't call that the Lord's prayer. No, modernize the Lord's prayer. Anyway, but I just appreciate you lifting that up because like you, you know, that's something that, although I spent just some a little bit of time as a Catholic when I was like little and then circled back to Christianity later in my life. Like that, those were words that were just like deep, you know, in the core of, in the core of my faith. So. Yeah. I mean, for Roman Catholics coming in and seeing that eternal light up front has a totally different connotation mm -hmm. because they assume there is the reserved sacrament somewhere. Mm, I never would have thought. Um, <laughs> and if you're not, out of that world, it doesn't dawn on you that that's the way it is. We're coming to the end of our time. And so I want to first of all say, I'm really sorry you all had such a hard time getting in. Um, Christian has asked Celeste to take the password off so that the link next week, you can just come right in um, and, and things will be fine. My dogs are proceeding to let me know that they're ready for some attention. Um, and I just want to thank you all. Next week, we're going to spend some time looking at the history of the Mayflower and um, and sort of what it has stood for um, in our culture, in our history. And it's been good and bad. It's a mixed thing. Um, so much of our lives are that way. Um, you know, we're we're a mixture of things. We're not none of us purely good and purely evil, um, or very few of us are. Um, so anyway, I thank you all for coming. And um, we'll Can I make a quick book recommendation. Yeah, Mayflower by Nathaniel Philbrick, P H I L 
B-R-I-C-K, is a very good history of the Mayfire and what exactly it was like and yeah. the colony. Yeah. It is. I will also say some of the historians of the UCC that I know have some quibbles with it. So um, it's hard to know for mm -hmm. sure, but it is a good book. Okay. We will see you all next week. Thank you, Anita. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. Anita.